Members of the Nigerian Army, Navy, Air Force, and Police Officers' Wives Association, various organizations here present, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I have the pleasure and honor to welcome you once again to this ceremony. The paper to be presented by Dr. Mrs. Abigail Bosega is on environmental sanitation as a tool for improved health services. I want to invite the chairman of the occasion, Dr. Victoria Mojeku, to take over the affairs of this morning's session. Thank you, Madam. Family support program. 
Lagos State, wife of Service Chief here present, and wife of Commander Lagos Garrison Command, wife of the Military Administrator and Chairperson of Family Support Program Adamawa State, the Chairman of this location, well, the Secretary to the State Government in absentia, Director General present, Chairman of Local Government here present, Wives of Chairman of Local Government, Members of the Armed Forces and Police Officers Wives Association, Fellow Resource Persons, Participants, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen. I am here to present a paper on the environmental sanitation as a tool for improved health services. A Nigerian Army Officers Wives Association, Naoba paper, presented during the workshop to conference on protocols, security and welfare organized by the Lagos State Family Support Program Chairperson. Introduction. As we are all aware, the main focus of this workshop to conference is protocol security and welfare. However, my concern in this paper is targeted on welfare. Even with this, my discussion is going to center on environmental sanitation as a tool for improved health services. In doing this, my emphasis will be on the role of the Magadjia RSM within our barracks and their effectiveness in the realization of this broad objective. Before going on to the specific focus of this paper, I will want to reflect briefly on the importance of health. Mankind's recognition of the importance of health dates back to several thousand years. The constitution of the World Health Organization, signed on 22nd of July 1946, formally declared the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health to be one of the fundamental rights of every being and stated further that the health of all people is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security. The link between sanitation and public health has long been established. Since the early part of the last century, doctors, planners and engineers have recognized that improvements in sanitation are vital for improvements in public health. The recognition of the positive correlation between good sanitation and water supply and human health and the recognition as well of the general poor state of water supply and sanitation service to the majority of the population of the world led to the designation of the 1980s as the International Drinking Water Supply and Sanitation Decade at the United Nations Water Conference at Mar del Plata, Argentina in 1977. Environmental Sanitation Environmental sanitation can be defined as a process of removing physical, chemical, and biological nuisances which constitute hazards or have negative effects on human health and well-being. It deals with the following. A, provision of safe and adequate supply of water, B, disposal of waste, C, food hygiene, D, provision of good housing, E, pest control, F, control of animal reservoirs of infection, G, air hygiene and prevention of atmospheric pollution, H, elimination of other hazards, e.g. noise. In addition, Social and economic factors contribute significantly to the environment. In the African region, some of these factors are rapid population growth and migration, poverty and illiteracy, industrial and agricultural development, cultural attitudes and beliefs, which govern collective and individual responses to environmental conditions. The severity and multiplicity of these problems and their constant threats to both urban and rural populations have led to environmental health 
being considered in the African context as a starting point for most, if not all, health activities in the region. The three major causes of morbidity and mortality in the developing countries are waterborne, foodborne, and vector-borne communicable diseases. The problems of environmental sanitation cannot be divulged from the individual hygiene, since individuals make communities. Personal hygiene encompasses those practices and habits which will protect an individual from disease and sustain him in the highest degree of health. Washing, taking a bath, or swimming brings about a feeling of relaxation and tranquility. Several skin and eye infections may be caused by ectoparasites, bacteria, mold, and fungi, which are mechanically removed by washing the body or clothing with soap and water. The collective effects of individual awareness of personal hygiene have significant effects on, the, on the environmental sanitation. Effects of uncontrolled env environment on health. Poor refuse disposal attracts and breeds flies, as well as provide food and shelter for rodents. It can cause fire hazards and be sources of accidents through cuts and puncture wounds from sharp objects. Water retaining receptacles and overgrown weeds will propagate mosquito breeding and therefore malaria incidences. The inadequate disposal of infected human feces leads to the contamination of the ground and sources of water supply. Poor excreta disposal can lead to incidences of diseases such as cholera, dysentery, worm infestations and, under, and other intestinal infections. Poor water and food hygiene will also result to many diseases that render its victims physically ineffective while suffering from the disease and sometimes even after. Environmental sanitation in the barracks, the role of the Magajia stroke RSM, the need for grassroots involvement in health-related and health-directed activities cannot be overemphasized. More directly, Health education of communities is an essential complementary activity to sanitation improvement. If the full health benefits are to be realized, there is also the need to promote the correct use, maintenance, and good hygiene practices related to sanitation. It is important that all members of the community use sanitation facilities, including children, Sanitation is often relatively low on the priority scale of individuals in the community. It is important that people be enlightened on the potential health benefits that may be gained from improved sanitation. Most importantly, communities should be aware of how sanitation may be improved and how to be active participants in deciding when and how sanitation should be improved. Meeting the goals of environmental sanitation will require active community participation and improvement at all stages. Many of the failures of the past can be traced to lack of community involvement in decision making, implementation and evaluation. This also calls for people's awareness of the benefits to be derived from these services. It is a well known fact that women as mothers of the nation constitute a vital group that require health education. Their degree of mobilization has determined to a large extent the success or failure of many programs in the past. It is therefore only wise to approach the mobilization of our women for environmental sanitation with all seriousness. Mother Jayas are well recognized women leaders in our barracks and they have enormous influence over soldiers' wives. Apart from assisting and ensuring discipline among soldiers' wives, they coordinate the dissemination of information within the barracks. They therefore constitute a resource group, which if given the necessary basic training, will be of great use for enhancement of environmental sanitation activities in the Nigerian army. Because of the regimental nature of our barracks life, the, san the sanitary situation is reflective of the amount of interest the barracks commander has in sanitation. The RSM, 
mobilizes troops for fatigue on sanitation exercise days. He ensures that the block leaders clear their, surra clear their block surroundings and also ensures that the fourteen soldiers are disciplined. Maka Diaz mobilized soldiers' wives and children for fatigue, not only on sanitation exercise days, but as daily routine. They serve as role model for families of soldiers and are able to enforce discipline, disciplinary action on airy members. With respect to environmental sanitation, they help educate family members on personal hygiene, ensure positive sanitary practices, and assist the health department in abatement of nuisance by ensuring prompt compliance with abatement notices served in respect of such nuisance. Unit Regimental Sergeant major, Majors, RSNs, are the most senior other ranks in their respective units. Having risen to that level through the ranks, they have enormous experience and influence over the troops in their units. They are well respected by troops. Enforcement of discipline and compliance with orders issued by superior officers to troops in the main is their duty. They therefore serve as role models to soldiers in the units. As a very important member of Sanitation Barrack Committee, he ensures compliance with directives of the committee. The committee looks out for the following sanitary nuisances with a view of abating them. A. Overgrown weeds. B. Insanitary structures. C. Broken and filled septic tanks and soak away pits. D. Uncleared refuse dumps. E. Littering of refuge. F. Blocked drainage. Blood drain, G, uncontrolled wandering of animals, e.g. dogs, H, lack of adequate and wholesome food items at the money market, J, mosquito breathing, which could be water retaining receptacles. One of the most of our basic the nuisances generated above is by the establishment of sanitation of sanitary squads in every barrack. This is usually made up made up of about ten to fifteen members. Units in the cantonment contribute personnel to this group and soldiers in the guard room can beat up the number. The squad is under the supervision of the Army Health Department and is responsible for the daily routine cleanliness of vital areas of the barracks. The duties include emptying of refuse bins, picking of refuse litter along major roads in the barracks, preparing refuse pits for the burial of refuse, destroying or arresting stray animals in the barracks, nurturing of flowers and beautification efforts, malaria control duties, e.g. oiling of pools of water, any other duty as may be directed by the Barracks Sanitation Committee. Barracks Environmental Sanitation Competition. In its efforts to promote and maintain a clean and healthy environment in the barracks, and arrest the dangers of epidemics, NAOWA annually sponsors Barrack Environmental Sanitation Competition to ginger troops and their families to greater heights of cleanliness. The prizes at this competition consist of trophies which are presented at formation and army headquarters levels. At the formation, the latest barrack is presented with the formation NAOWA President's Trophy. All trophies are gold, are gold cups. The non-provision of cash award is deliberate since it could be counterproductive in the areas of team spirit and unit regimentation. This year's competition is going on about now and will last for the next one month. An inspection team comprising senior officers and a NAOA member has been set up for this purpose and is presently going round the division. Conclusion. Despite the high level of investment in sanitation in many developing countries during the water and sanitation decade that is the 80s, there has been only very little improvement in the proportion of the population who have access to adequate sanitation facilities. Providing environmental sanitation services to communities, especially in developing countries like ours, will require special tra strategies which will be closely linked with the primary health care strategy. These will include promotional 
educational and supportive considerations, including health education, use of simplified and inexpensive technologies, and also community involvement for self-help solutions. This paper has tried to throw light on environmental sanitation as exemplified by Army Barracks through cantonment situation and the role played by the Mother GRs and RSMs in this respect within the barracks. Thank you. Thank you. The hand you have given her is not a lot. Give her a lot of hand. Honestly, I've changed my mind about the army. <laughs> <laughs> this morning, I said I didn't like the army. I was afraid of them as a child. But this morning, right now, the army is right on top. Give her a hand. You, you have just been beautifully entertained by this young lady. We've been told about environmental sanitation. We've been told about the way we throw our refuge all over the place. We've been told about the effect of this refuse, bad habits in disposal of refuse. How it affects the water we drink and the water we use in washing <coughs> our clothing and our children, etc., etc. How it affects even the diseases we carry, cholera, typhoid, and the rest of them. How it breathes flies, which we don't like. I think we need to give her another hand. Give her a hand. We have been told that all of us are going to the Magajia Do you agree? Yes. In our respective way. We are all women. Women are the number one of mankind in this world. God created man first and created woman second. But as far as I'm concerned, he actually created woman first. But he wanted, he wanted the men to think that he created them first. Give God a hand. <laughs> now we have about 10 minutes for questions and comments. Please make it very short. No preaching, no Bible, no Quran, nothing. <laughs> We are talking about raping disposal and the effect it has on our environment. Do we agree on the law? If you bring me your Bible and your Quran, I will shut up. It's that. Comments from anybody? Yes, a woman there. Please identify yourself and make it short. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. The chairpersons on the high table, the chairman of the occasion, my fellow women, I am Bernadette Kain. I must really congratulate the last speaker. She has done a beautiful work, which we've all taken in. But I'd like to bring up a, a little observation. We are happy that all the army wives are well taken care of in the barracks by the Magajias. We would like to appeal to this gathering where our appeals will be taken to the proper quarters that some of us that haven't got uh, Magajias around us in our homes, but we can see most of these gutters and uh, drainages around us that are not flowing. Please help us to do something that these gutters and uh, drainages should flow because we do see the mosquito lovers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any more comments from the floor? Are the ladies shy? Yes. Yes, ma'am. And the lady is white. Your Excellency, all protocol observed. Please, I would like to know who are the Magadiers. And having asked that, uh, that will help us to know whether to imitate them as the chairman has uh, indicated or not. Thank you. The Magadiers, I understand, are women in the past who take care of their surroundings. 
these are the wives of the ministry men. Am I right? Oh, okay. When it comes round, she would oh, we'll have to answer it right away. Mother, could you tell us who the mother is? Yes, the mother here are the wives of uh, the soldiers in the barracks. You find that the senior soldiers, you, in the army you have the soldiers and you have the officers. You know, the wives of the senior soldiers, you know, like the Arisons in the barracks, the, the wives of such people form the magazine, the different barracks and units. Thank you. All protocol beautifully observed. I was going to add that uh, in the Navy, for instance, you don't have MAC IGS, but you have a different system. You have the uh, officer in charge of the barracks and then down the line like that. But beyond the role that you easily see the MAC IGS play in the barracks, I look at the MAC IGS as a symbol of womanhood. She is charged the responsibility of keeping the environment clean. If we then need to transfer this to the civil world, I would say that every woman in her own house should be a manager. Yeah. And to me, as such this transfer of knowledge, I want to say it has to say in education. The issue of blood drainage. While I accept that local government areas should be responsible, I think the take-off point, the departure point, is that we also should not block the drainage. If you look at the drainage very well, a lot of garbage you find there comes right from the house. So if we start from the point of knowing what our responsibility is towards the block drainage, which in itself will now create problems once it rains, I then think that we should learn a lot from the philosophy of Magajia in the armed forces. Thank you. I think that was superb. Will you please give her a hand? I don't know. I don't know why she was not asked to come and present the paper. <laughs> but what she said is very true. How many of us with my mind and threw the paper in the gutter? How many? Don't put your hands up. <laughs> How many of us eat and give it and throw the garbage uh, in the gutter? Don't put your hands up. How many of us have the thing that comes out of a baby's uh, bottom and put it in the gutter? Don't put your hands up. Let us talk about ourselves. We like to talk about government, government, government. Who is the government? Is it us? Is it not us? Who is the government? Uh, put your, say me, say me. Me, I am the government. <laughs> and you do your own thing and all that. Let I will do my own thing and the gutters will not be filled up. Yeah. Whether the man that gets are limited to the papers 
or whether they are also they also increase in their body count. Which other counts do you have in Lagos? Please help me. So many. I mean, Amber, two points. 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 Did you hear what they said? Yeah? And they are not talking now. Any more of them? I can't hear you because it is no sweet, so you don't shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Any more comments, please? We have time for one speaker, yes? Uh, no, no, you've spoken already. Okay, let's give the speak. Okay, just one more, and then we have the response from the floor. Yes, um, I'm making for from the Ministry of Labor State. Although in the widow the civil servants, we have staff quarters. In our staff quarters, we gather ourselves together and we try as much as possible to do the environmental sanitation. The local government will come into the staff quarters to do any of the training for us. But what we are getting now, we don't have mandate yet, and we don't have officers that are empowered to reach. And that one is giving us a lot of problems. Because if you want to take the challenge, you want to do something, some people will not cooperate. And you are not empowered to do anything than to try and lobby and lead those who will not cooperate with you. So we've now gained, and the Secretary of the Military, the State Government is not around now. It is something will be done about officers who are in charge of that person who is in the environmental Thank you very much. I did say that this is the last, but I think we need this comment. Shall we have the comment from here? Thank you, Chairman, Your Excellency, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. I just would like to looks like it's a day of coming, a bit uh, more to what the previous speaker said about having leadership to control whatever you want to do. But in fact, I would like to share an experience I gathered from uh, Indonesia a couple of months ago. The manager system was uh, had actually been taken even further than an enclosure or an environment. A whole street can come together, form a group, and clear their refuse. First of all, you are taught how to dispose your garbage from your home. And then it's all collected together as a collective effort on a street and called a district. And you all organize how to get it to one point. And at that point, it's easier for the local government to pick up your refuse. And of course, if it's not picked up, as a group, you can then go to your headquarters and remind them that look, you haven't picked up the garbage. But this is all voluntary and you have people call by from pages. They also take it upon themselves to go to different uh, streets to see that these things are done. It's not left to government, it's all self help And because of our environment and our health, we should really be willing uh, to help. We don't need the police uh, to urge us on to do what we do for us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I agree with her entirely. Let me make a little comment. He is the chairman or chairwoman, chairperson of the local government. Are they here, the ladies, the women? Are they here? Yes. Are they here? Yes. Are they here? Yes. Can you just put their hands up? I will not look at them. Just put your hands up. <laughs> How many? <laughs> One, two. Okay. okay, put your hands up. I didn't see you, Shia. Let me say what I want to say. How many of you? Chairwoman, are you listening? Of local government in Lagos State. How many of you go around your streets where you are responsible for during the environmental days, or rather after the environmental days, environmental day, to see <laughs> that your own people carry the garbage away. Don't answer. 
No, don't answer because uh, I don't want an answer because uh, it's irritating you. I'm a terrible woman. You don't know that. Eh? I don't know. I'm a troublemaker. Because many garbages are seen on the street. Is that also in labor states? Even in Nigeria as a whole. Garbages are seen on the streets in the gutters. People carry these things and put in the big bin and you find them in the gutter whenever the rain falls. They are not carried away generally. <clears throat> uh, can we have the excellent presenter please answer the questions? There are about six for you and you have only five minutes. Thank you. Well, I think most of the comments, I mean most of the contributions are comments. The first one made an appeal that gutters and drainage, I mean in Lagos flow. I believe that the, the point has been made that if the gutter in front of my own house is clean, then there is less work for those in positions of authority to do. So the, the, the first thing is for me to make sure I don't block my gutter and then the whole gutter will be all right. In addition, I think it's also an appeal to those in positions of authority to do something about it. The second person spoke and asked who are the magazines which we have explained. And then we learned something from that that um, as much as possible, the Magadia's um, experience or the Magadia's way of life is something that we can emulate. We may not call them Magadia's, but there should be somebody in charge of um, sanitation in the different places where we live, like the state government quarters, our streets, which Madam cited like the Indonesia experience where the streets I mean, the people in the street gather together and decide that they will clean their environment, I mean, from, and on frequent uh, basis. Then also the message has gone to us that we should check some of the things we do at the Bonnie Camp, like the climbing of the wall by the children and then messing up the places, I mean, messing up the, the shores of the ocean. I also think, um, I think that's about all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Give her a big hand. I thought you were just asking. Give her a big hand. You see, this uh, happy woman, she does not only um, ensure security to her life by protecting us Nigerians, she's also a doctor, a nurse, an environmental planner. An environmental sanitation expert. Will you please give her a big hand? Thank you very much, madam. Thank you. You can have your seat in front. The next person is the lady. Paper on widowhood. Paper on widowhood. of the military administrator and chairperson of the Family Support Program Lagos State, wife of Chair Service Chief, the wife of a GOC Army Headquarters Lagos, wife of the State Military Administrator and Chairperson of the FSP Adamawa State, the Secretary to the State Military Government, Chairman of the Occasion, Directors General and Wives of DGs, Chairperson FSP local, local government chapters, top government functionaries, members of the Armed Forces and Police Officers Wives Association, the Erelu of Lagos, 
workshop participants, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. The topic before me is widowhood. I am also mandated, however, to examine some legal issues associated with the topic. So you will please bear with me if I take a little more of your time. Introduction. The Naval Officers Wives Association NOAA feels highly honored to be invited to present a paper on the all important subject of widowhood. It is all important because of its direct relevance to the armed forces community in particular and the society in general. Owing to the hazard of nature of the military job, unfortunate casualties occur from time to time, either in the battlefront or during daily routine exercises even in peacetime. Instances include the ongoing economic operations in Liberia, the various peacekeeping missions in parts of the world, the C-130 air disaster, and others too numerous to be mentioned. Former President of France, late General Charles de Gaulle, rightly observed, and I quote, men who adopt the profession of arms have ceased to be masters of their faith. If they drop in their tracks, if the rashes are scattered to the four winds, that is all part and parcel of the job, I of course. Even for men who have not adopted the profession of arms, death is inevitable. The traumatic and devastating effects which such tragedies have on the social, economic, political, and psychological state of the diseased immediate family cannot be overemphasized. Today, widows constitute a sizable proportion of the population of wives of service personnel and the citizenry in general. It is therefore appropriate that this category of women be accorded considerable attention and assistance to enable them adjust adequately to a new life as single heads of households, breadwinners, and decision makers. In. This paper seeks to examine the basic issues relating to widowhood in Nigeria. To achieve this aim, the paper will cover the following areas. A. Perceptions of widowhood. B. Widowhood and its agony. C. Some remedial measures aimed at reducing the plight of widows. D. Constitutional rights of widows. And E enforcement of the legislation. Perceptions of widowhood. In discussing widowhood, it is perhaps crucial to highlight the various perceptions of womanhood with due emphasis though on widowhood. When the General Assembly of the United Nations declared in 1948 that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, it was not intended that the rights be limited to the male human being. Notwithstanding, women have continued to be regarded as chattels useful only for housework, farm work, and procreation, or to be part of assets or liabilities to be inherited at the demise of their husbands. African women live in the bondage of customs and traditions, which often relegate them to an inferior status. Traditions have been used to dominate and manipulate women to the extent of denying them of their inalienable human rights of divorce, marriage, inheritance, job opportunities, etc. There is substantial evidence to show that from the beginning, the very beginning, women were subjected to all forms of discrimination and deprivation in all facets of life. From the religious perspective, the scriptures tend to provide reasons for the subjugation of the woman. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 to 35, it, was it is stated, and I quote, Let your woman keep silent 
it in the churches. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the Lord. And if they like anything, let them ask their husbands at home, I am quote. Also, from Timothy chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, reads, I quote, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor you suck anything over the men, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. I unquote. The Bible is not alone in this declaration. In Islam, the Holy Quran, chapter 4, verse 34, prescribes, I quote, men are the protectors and maintenance of, and maintenance of women because Allah has given the one more strength than the other. And because they support them for their means, therefore, the righteous women are devoutly obedient and guard in the husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. As to those women on whose part ye feel disloyalty and ill conduct, admonish them first, next, refuse to share their beds, and last, beat them lightly. <laughs> I am good. Well, I see that you ponder all over these verses, but I dare not attempt any interpretation of them. I prefer to respectfully leave you, leave their literal interpretations to your different imagination. It suffices to observe that the struggle for female emancipation is as old as creation, and only time, patience, and perseverance can get women where they rightfully aspire to be. Pre-Islamic era. Even before the advent of Islam or Christianity, women were relegated to the background in many parts of the world. Among the pre-Islamic Arabs, women were regarded as economic burdens who could neither own nor inherit a deceased relation's property. They were themselves regarded as property to be inherited. Among the Hindus, for instance, a woman was a slave to her male counterpart and was therefore subjected to all forms of inhumanity. She was even cremated with her husband upon his death. Of course, she had no right to leave if her husband died. Customs and traditions. Some cultural customs and traditions in Nigeria were also quite inhibiting. For example, Customs existed that gave paternity of a child to a husband, even when he was not the biological father, so long as the dowry had not been refunded. Similarly, a wife could not sue her husband if he, if, he, if he was indebted to her. Her husband was also not liable to pay debts owed by the wife to another person. In addition, Whereas the husband had rights in his wife's property, a wife had no corresponding rights in the husband's property, whether living or dead. These are some of the experiences of a woman even while her husband lived. We can therefore imagine the situation if he was dead. Widowhood and its agony. To say that the impact of discrimination against women is mostly felt when a woman assumes the status of widow is an understatement. The Webster's English Dictionary defines a widow as a woman who has not remarried since the death of her husband. Upon the death of her husband, the woman's status in the society changes and she becomes different things to different people. To some, she is the witch who has killed her husband and is condemned as such even before trial. To prove her innocence, she must visit several gods at very odd and scary hours. She must drink all sorts of concoction. She must not see the sunlight for so many days, weeks or months. She must not bath. She comes out a traumatized beast, not only because of the loss of a dear one, 
but from the ostracity that accompanies the loss. It is also not uncommon to hear of the plight of widows whose property acquired during marriage are cut away by her in-laws while she is mourning with her children. An example is one arising from the Ejibo C-130 air disaster. While the entire nation was still struggling to recover from the shock of losing all those men of the armed forces, the pages of newspapers were reporting stories of how relatives of dead men engaged in battles with widows over property and money paid out by the government to families of the deceased officers. I refer you to the Daily Times of October 16, 1992. Burial rights. Apart from the psychological pain and trauma experienced by the widow, other unappealing rights must be performed by her. Such rights vary from tribe to tribe. You will find that even among communities or groups of people, there are still local variations. And so you find that what obtains in village A may be different or a slightly different or totally different from what obtains in village B, even if they are just one or two miles apart. And more especially because there are no specific laws or welfare packages governing the affairs of widows in Nigeria. In certain parts of what was known as Bendel State, now Edo and Delta, the widow was first established her innocence and non-involvement with her husband's death. She was subjected to taking an oath and drinking from the water used in washing the cups of her husband. Many women lost their lives from this experience, not because they killed their husbands, but because the dead men themselves actually suffered from the deadly cerebral meningitis which made them to foam in the mouth. <coughs> Among the Ishan and Igbo people, a widow must shave off all her hair and appear in dark colored ragged clothes for up to one year. Among the Nupe, widows were not allowed to wash, place their hair or go out for 40 days. Among the Benins in Edo State, the situation is equally tormenting. As soon as her husband dies, the widow is immediately taken to the back room, where she spends the next seven days on the bed floor with a few leaves spread at mass. She sits next to a fire that must remain burning for the whole period. She ties only a small cloth with her right hand and eats with her left hand. She does not touch water except for drinking, so her hand remains unwashed for the entire period. At dusk and dawn, she goes to the back of the house to lament. On the seventh day, she keeps an all-night vigil in the company of her relatives. At 4 p.m., she picks up the leaves, wood and ashes and goes to an appointed place where she throws away all the items used for money, including the small cloth on her. She returns home stark naked, chanting songs all the way back. At home, she bathes and ties another wrapper before entering the house. Thereafter, she wears black for at least one full year and does not go out for the next three months. All that I have mentioned are practices due to age-law acceptance have become law in their respective areas of practice. Some remedial measures. The agonies of the widow are not the only impediment to freedom of the woman to exist side by side with her male counterpart. Perhaps the woman would seem to have gone extinct but for the fear of men to exist alone. The dynamics of societal influence and other cultures have led to consistent infiltration of some other foreign and positive influences which are mingling with us. This to some extent greatly influence the orientation of societal members. Elements of these occur 
in both the customary and statutory laws. Provisions of the customary law. Under the customary law, custom and tradition play dominant roles. In some Igbo societies, for instance, a woman could not acquire or inherit immovable property such as land or house. However, outside the communal or family land, she could acquire property. If she got married and brought such property to her husband's place, however, the property, like herself, gets inherited. She can also not dispose of her property without her husband's consent. Upon the death of her husband, she cannot participate in the disposition of his property, including hers, since she herself is regarded as an object of inheritance. The Ijo custom does not permit inheritance of the deceased property to the widow. Similarly, a widow or daughter in Ibibio land does not inherit property. As a mark of respect in ethnic land, however, the first daughter enjoys inheritance. Under the Bini rule of inheritance, the rights of daughters are highly insignificant. At the death of the man, the elder surviving son inherits the property absolutely. In the more developed Yoruba customary law of inheritance, female as well as male children can inherit their parents' real estate equally, applying the Iji or Oriojori rule. The shares, however, belong to the children, not the mother. The Iji and Oriojori rule. Iji and Oriojori rule are legally coined persistent or per capita. In using the Ibiigi method, the, the division of the property is based on the number of wives and not on the number of children. For instance, if a man left three widows and they each have three, six, and ten children respectively, the property is divided into three. And each wife collects for, on behalf of her children. That is for onward transmission to her, to her children. If the children on their own decide to hand over their, respect, their properties to their respective mothers, it is their own kettle of fish. For the Oriotori method, the property is divided based on the number of children without reference to the number of wives. If there are 30 children, the property is divided into 30 and the children benefit equally, whether male or female. But you can see that either way, the widow is irrelevant and highly inconsequential. In most parts of the northern community, females are excluded from inheriting land. In the absence of male children, or if the children are infants, the brother of the deceased inherits for and on behalf of the male children. He could inherit even the wives of his late brother. Where there are no relations, the property goes to the community. On the other hand, whereas female children are totally excluded from inheriting their father's movable or immovable property, they can inherit all their mother's immovable property. At the end of the day, the widow is left in an unhappy state and chooses either to return destitute to her own family or alternatively remain with her late husband's family by agreeing to be inherited by one of his kinsmen. Distinguished participants, the various laws and practices so far highlighted further amplify the predicament of widows even under customary law. Perhaps the only way out of this problem is for a wife to maintain very good and close relationship with her husband and in-laws while he is still alive and persuade him to make a will so that at his death his property would be distributed in accordance with the will. 
You may perhaps wonder if it is really possible for a wife to persuade her husband to make a will, especially as uh, the, the idea of the will itself to connote something you do uh, privately and in secret. Uh, to a great extent, I think this is possible because if a wife is particularly good, if she has been good to the man as a good wife and mother, and if she has stood by him, if she's not a sunshine wife who believes in only when the going is good, I think in all probability that that man would not want such a woman to suffer when he is no more. And I'm sure some of us here will recall that some time ago on Newsline there was this episode of a highly placed Nigerian who decided to give his wife's share of his property to her even though he is still alive. He decided to do this because according to him, his wife has been very good, she's not Nigerian, and she stood by him through thick and thin. So he believes that, and that he would not want um, any controversies or problems to arise when he is no more. I think this is...